So the other reading project I've been doing is taking a deep dive through Russian literature. This started with reading Fountainhead by Ayn Rand. I read that one about a year ago. And then a little later on, about half a year ago, I would say I finished reading Gulag Archipelago by Alexander Solzhenitsyn. And that's the one that I would say changed my way of thinking about the world. To the point where this this book, Gulag Archipelago, actually inspired me to make a whole reading plan, put all the Russian classics under my belt before going back to Gulag Archipelago for a second time to reread that with the context of Tolstoy, Pushkin, Dostoevsky, the, the classic Russian writers, and really dig into Gulag Archipelago a second time. So I'll start off talking about Fountainhead. Ayn Rand is an interesting writer. She was born in early 20th century Russia, moved to America in 1926. She wrote some really interesting books, really interesting writing style, and she is very much a product of Stalinism, or rather communism in general. She is a knee-jerk reaction against that totalitarian system that the Russians had at the time. And her writing, although she wrote fiction, it very much reflects her views about all the ways what that government was doing is wrong. Fountainhead is set in New York City. It follows the life of an architect with very unconventional ideas about building design. I read that one cover to cover. It follows his love life, follows his rivals, follows his whole career and how he justifies being such a trendsetter and so different from the accepted norm and why he continues going his own way despite being rejected by customers, by the press, by the entire industry. He struggles his whole life, but he does it his way. He does his own thing. And the book is about, at least the main point, the main takeaway I got from it, is about being someone who creates something original rather than someone who just copies what other people do and takes the credit for it. It's a bit of a long read, so are her other books, but as I have come to find, that is very much a pattern in Russian literature. Fictional tomes of overwhelming length that just go super, super into depth about the emotional lives of the characters, about their philosophy, about their psychology. Gulag Archipelago uh, by Solzhenitsyn, when, co when you compare him to the other classic Russian writers, it's a little bit different in that this one is nonfiction, but the book is just as long, if not longer. It's one of the longest I've read. I would say longer than Anna Karenina, and probably, yes, probably longer than Romance of the Three Kingdoms and Water Margin. But boy, oh boy, I think this one is worth it. So Solzhenitsyn, in his old life, he was an officer in the Russian military during World War II, and he describes how he was arrested and sent to prison over some letters that he had sent to a former acquaintance who happened to be from one of the countries that Russia was hostile with during the war. And of course, sending letters to a foreign national like that, he was accused of espionage, he was accused of being a traitor to the people, to the grand cause, and no trial, just throw him in jail. And he describes the entire process, the arrest, the interrogation, torturing you until you've forced to sign papers that say you did something that you're not even guilty of. All the psychology tricks they play on you during the interrogation. Talks about there's people who are told that their families are in the other room, and then they have a woman scream at just the right time, and it sounds like your wife, and they, they just, there is such a wealth of methods for torturing both physically and psychologically the human mind. The Russians really were cutting edge on torture. But it doesn't stop there. The book goes through his entire time in camp and doesn't exactly do it chronologically, more does it examining every aspect of life in camp, all the various types of camp, prison camp that is, all the different types of work someone could be assigned to, what the food was like, what the bed was like, what the living conditions were like, what the punishments were like, the kinds of people who got in there because it was so many people who basically did nothing wrong. They ran afoul of some Stalinist law that was created for the purpose of putting ideological opponents of the party away out of society, arresting people who have no clue why they're being arrested, throwing millions in these prison work camps, to the point where it became an economy that needed to be fed with fresh bodies, so they just started, at some point, arresting people just to arrest them, like the laws would come and go. He describes the law of the day. It could be saying something wrong about this or that, or it could be being accused of economic sabotage, or wrecking as they called it. So millions of innocent people thrown into prison work camps with no trial, tortured until they sign a confession, and then they're declared guilty so they have to stay in there for 5, 10, 15 years, 
And then after they get out, they're sent to these exile camps. So they're not even fully integrated into the old society that they once knew. And Solzhenitsyn also describes the spiritual side of it. The consequences of having so much time alone with yourself to think. And how that forces you to transform yourself. Because you examine everything that ever happened in your past. And if there's something there that's genuinely worthy of you feeling guilty for, well, years and years on end of being alone with, with your thoughts, if there's something there, your mind is gonna find it and fixate on it. And it forces you to absolutely transform who you are on a spiritual level as a human being. And one of the famous quotes from the book was actually, thank you, prison. So after I finished that, I decided to make a whole reading list. I put Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, Pushkin on there. I have Machiavelli on there, and then I have some of Ayn Rand's other books, Atlas Shrugged and Virtue of Selfishness. Those two are on my reading list, and then I'm going to round it out by going over Gulag Archipelago a second time. The ones that I read are already, I'll start with Anna Karenina by Tolstoy. That one, again, a super long fictional tome that goes absolutely microscopically in-depth into the characters' emotional lives. It follows a few different families. One of the families, it starts out, the book actually opens with the husband waking up and remembering what he did the night before, and remembering, oh yeah, I'm, I'm in this situation, I'm a cheating husband, my wife caught me, oh yeah, okay, I gotta deal with this. The second couple is the wife's sister, who at the beginning of the book is unmarried, and describes her courtship process and her early marriage life and even including the birth of her first child with the man who she is to marry. And then the third couple is the husband's, the husband of the first couple, his sister, who is already married, but she's married unhappily, and she is pursued by a younger single man, eventually gives in and starts an affair with him. Eventually, of course, her husband finds out, so they break it off, they go away and have fun in Europe, and they have a new child, and she's tortured by the thought of leaving her first son, the son with her first husband, behind, but she has no choice. And this third couple is the one that just devolves into constant bickering. And the whole premise of the book, one of the opening lines is, all happy couples look the same and all unhappy couples are different each in their own way. Uh, I'm quoting from memory, that, that might be a paraphrasing, but it's something to that effect. So it examines these couples with a focus on, after watching book reviews of this, my favorite review was the one that Michael Knowles did, with a focus on the ways that virtue, possibly specifically religious virtue, is the only way to make a happy couple while there are so many other ways for couples to fall into vice and disagreement and bickering and just torturing each other and themselves. The translation of that one that I listened to, of course I listened to the audiobook, the translation was Nathan Haskell Dole. I found the language to both add to and remove from the narrative. There were points where the story felt a little dry and just nothing exciting going on. I don't know if that was a result of the narrator, or a result of the translation, or even just a result of the original writing. Because, let's face it, it's a huge book. Reading anything of that length, it's inevitable my eyes are gonna glaze over at some point. But the thing I liked about it is the choice of words, the choice of language that was used, it still really felt like something that was written in the 19th century. And that, I think, did a lot to immerse me more in the story. The next thing I read was Crime and Punishment by Dostoevsky. Crime and Punishment was certainly an interesting one. It's about a college student who has a theory that certain people are great individuals, they have superior qualities, they are capable of judging what is the greater good, and therefore they have moral authority to decide if certain crimes are permissible for the greater good. And he frequently uses Napoleon as an example of this. So he takes his theory and he looks at a local pawnbroker lady, an old woman. She's known for being miserly, uh, mean to her sister. She's known for being unkind, unfair. And he thinks to himself about all the good that he could do with all the money that she has squirreled away. And he judges that it would be for the greater good if she were to be killed and the money to be used for charitable purposes. So he has that plan, he goes about planning out all the details, 
He commits the murder, steals a bunch of things from her home. He didn't plan on the sister walking in while he was mid-murder, so he ends up murdering them both. Narrowly escapes getting caught in the act, and then he escapes, makes a clean getaway, hides the money and the things they took from the house, plans not to use it for at least a few years, otherwise it would be suspicious that, hey, where did you suddenly get all this money from? And then from there, the book goes on a long journey about him having to live with what he's done. He's not counting on the emotional baggage of having committed a murder. He lays out everything, all the logical, all the practical steps, but he didn't count on being weighed down by guilt and having that particular stumbling stone in his way. And meanwhile, there's a Detective Petrovich who's on his track, sniffing out of the case. And this detective, his strong suit is psychological profiling of criminals, which is, at the time the book was written, it was a new science, and this was really a new kind of book. This was, I've heard it described as the first in the genre of psychological detective novels. And there are some scenes with the murderer talking to the detective that are just masterfully done, with layer upon layer of meaning every time one of the two of them speaks. The novel, like the other ones, this one is a very long beast to get through, but for all the trouble, it does present a lot to think about, and it's a great example of a particular type of book that I love, which is a fiction book that forces you to consider philosophical ideas and interact with them. It's presenting an idea or an argument or an ideology in wrapped up into a nice gripping story, and an actual quality story. And this type of thing is why I like reading Heinlein so much. The classic Russian writers were great at this, and despite the length of all their books, I am very much enjoying going through all these. As far as a takeaway from Crime and Punishment, if anything, I would say it could be authority, absolute moral authority, coming from God and not from any human. For a number of reasons, not least of which is anytime humans disagree on what is moral or immoral, there's going to be wars, there's going to be fighting, there's going to be crimes and murder. Every time some young guy comes along with a theory, oh, you should be allowed to kill such and such people for the greater good, every time that happens, there's going to be murders if there's not some higher authority, higher than humans, higher than the law even, an authority that's capable of providing that moral guidance. I look forward to reading more. I am currently uh, in the beginning parts of The Brothers Karamazov, also by Dostoevsky. The introduction to this one, I feel like I need to do a lot of extra work to understand all the background and all the context, but I also felt that way at the beginning of Crime and Punishment, where reading further into the book, I found I didn't really need to put that much effort into understanding it once the plot started unfolding. This one, the point I am in reading Brothers Karamazov, I wouldn't say the plot has quite started unfolding yet. I'm still in the part of part one where the brother that's chosen the religious path for his life, we're following him and the various wisdoms given by his master as he interacts with all the people who come to see him. So I'm not very far in yet, but I do intend to post a book review of that, possibly a book review for each part of the book, but we'll see how things go as it progresses. I've been taking notes on it, so I'll be ready. And I do believe that's all for now. I hope you enjoy. I'll talk to you later. Stay classy.